balance your trading strategy by adding futures. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global markets in a wide range of asset classes with CME Group. See what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash alpha. Welcome to Seeking Alpha's Alpha Trader podcast brought to you by CME Group. Every week on Alpha Trader, we go beyond the headlines and talk about major market trends and upcoming events that could affect your portfolio of stocks, bonds, or futures. Welcome to the program. I'm Aaron Task, alongside my co-host, Stephen Alpha, Managing Editor of Seeking Alpha. And Stephen, we have a, a really big shoe, doing my bad Ed Sullivan impersonation. It's been a, after a really big week. We had, of course, the Fed. We had the jobs numbers, a ton of earnings, more trade data. And we talked about a lot of that with our guest, Jim Grant of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. You definitely want to stay tuned for that interview in a few minutes here. But before we get to Jim, it was interesting. We talked with him a lot about the Fed, but we didn't really talk to him much about the actual state of the U.S. economy, which, again, after this week, you could paint a picture looking at the jobs numbers that everything's great. Certainly recessions off the table. Then you look at the ISM numbers, the Chicago PMI numbers, manufacturing seems like it's in a recession. So what's the reality here? That's an excellent question. My take is I would pay a little more attention to the employment numbers. Manufacturing could be reflecting the GM strike, a bit of the tariff war, but employment continues to chug along. As long as people are employed, they're not getting laid off, they're spending, companies are making money, and all is good. And the numbers this morning, the headline print was 128,000. Uh, 85,000 expected. So that was a beat. I would also note August and September numbers were revised pretty nicely upward. So the three-month average is uh, also doing very well. And I know Joe Bruswellis was out saying without the GM uh, interference, job gains would have been closer to about 180,000 in October. And I think the Trump administration is out and, and their, their numbers even higher than that. But I don't want to get into the spin room. But suffice it to say, the GM numbers did probably shave some numbers off that 128,000 headline. They did. And, and I don't want to get to the spin room either. And I think the bottom line is the jobs numbers on Friday were much stronger than expected, pretty much across the board. The upward revisions the last two months are very encouraging. And you also had over 300,000 people coming back into the workforce, which is why the unemployment rate ticked up to 3.6%, but it ticked up for a good reason. More people feel encouraged that they're able to find a job now. And so that's very encouraging. And again, you can spin things any way you want. It's really hard to spin those jobs numbers in a negative light, and especially given the expectations, because Wall Street, whether you like it or not, is so much about the expectations game. And the same thing for earnings. Again, coming into this earnings season, there was a lot of talk about earnings recession and things were really going to be terrible and the outlook for 2020 was too high and think numbers are going to be coming down. And now we're over 40% through the S&P 500. You have 80% of S&P 500 companies have beat expectations. Maybe they were lowered, but they beat the expectations. And 60%, more importantly, have beat on the revenue number which is better than you would normally see. So the earnings season is looking really good. The jobs numbers are looking really good. The market's at an all-time high as we're taping this podcast. So it's hard, as much as I could do it, it's hard to paint a bearish picture right now on the U.S., especially where, again, you have the Federal Reserve putting more fuel on the fire with another rate cut. Right. And they're also looking maybe smart for once in a while by saying essentially saying on Wednesday, we're done cutting rates for now unless we see some data showing otherwise that we need to cut more. So they look like they know what they're talking about. You made a great point about the labor force up over 300,000 in October. I would note year over year, the labor force is up about 1.4 million. And the unemployment rate has dropped from 3.8% to 3.6% over that time. So if folks want to know why the old school when unemployment rate got low enough, inflation perked up and the Fed had to tighten. Why that's not the case this time? Well, maybe there's a lot more slack in the economy than we thought with those low labor force participation numbers that have been kind of a hallmark of this expansion. Yeah, that's very true. And the other thing is a lot of the jobs that have been created are lower paying jobs in the services sector. The year over year hourly earnings gain is 3% now, which is a good number, but it's not as high as you would expect given an unemployment rate at three and a half percent or thereabouts. So that is something certainly that economists are, I don't want to say it's a new economy, but it's definitely different than the old days. That's a mitigating factor, I would say. But again, 
it's hard to be bearish when more people are going to work and their paycheck is going up. Maybe their paycheck isn't as big as they would like it to be. Mine certainly isn't, but Never. it's still more, right? And they still have a job. And that sets us up, I think, for a very strong holiday shopping season. I'm already seeing stories about Black Friday sales and specials and Kohl's is going to be open and which stores are going to be closed and on Thanksgiving Day. I mean, so we're already, so again, let's look ahead a little bit. We're already into November. Seasonally, it's the best time of the year for the stock market. Uh, our friend JC Peretz put out a note the other day saying, hey, the six months of the year were supposed to be the worst for the stock market. The stock market did pretty well. Now we're heading into the best historically six months of the year for the stock market. He's a bull. One more thing to, to think about if you're a bull, about the seasonality of the stock market, if you believe that, we're heading into the best time of the year. And again, the consumers are looking good as we head into the holiday shopping season. Corporate earnings have held up better than expected. So these are all the good things. So before we get to Jim Grant, who you know is going to give us some some skepticism and some negatives to think about because that's just who he is. The other thing that is out there is the trade talks, are the trade talks with China. And depending on the day, the markets are happy, the markets are sad, the markets are confused. But that to me is going to be the other big thing to keep an eye out as we head in between now and certainly the end of the year. Right. I think we'll continue to see some good days with the headlines, some bad days with the headlines. But overall, I don't see a ton of progress being made. And maybe it doesn't matter. I saw a headline out of a UPS report last night. I didn't get to read the whole report. But where it said, while everybody wants to talk the macro stuff and guys want to come on TV, while well, trade wars are bad, this, that, companies are moving supply chains. They're adjusting their business models, moving supply chains to other countries, cutting costs where they have to, whether it be in China or domestically, and they're adjusting to the tariffs. So never underestimate the ability of companies trying to turn lemons into lemonade, I guess. Right. And it's a great story of what's happening. And I use great, not like it's wonderful. It's just an amazing story. Again, there's a, so much happening on that front. The open question is, is there enough capacity outside of China to replace all the capacity inside of China? How does China respond to this? And really, from a negotiating perspective, you know, do they reach a point of maximum pain where they come to the table with the U.S. and say, OK, we're going to give in to President Trump and everything that you're asking for? Or do they say, you know what, President Trump's heading towards re-election and we're going to wait and see what comes out. So then we have another year or most of you know, the next year with these headlines of Yes, things are on, off, on, off from the trade talk. So it's such a political game as well. My point of view, and I've heard others make this as well, is that this is not short-term situation. That for the next 20 years or more, we're going to be going back and forth with China because China has emerged as a global superpower, economically at least, and they want to stay there. And they're not going to back down to the United States. So these are major geopolitical issues that are going to continue to affect the markets and investments and politics really probably for, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the next several years at least. Yeah, I think you're 100% correct. This is a 12-dimensional game of chess. And to think that a, a couple parties across from a table are just going to kind of agree to something, sign a piece of paper, and it's going to go away. That's not All happening. right. So we'll have 12-dimensional chess over China. And when we come back, we'll play at least three-dimensional <laughs> chess with Jim Grant. You definitely want to stick around for that. Take a deep dive into futures to arm yourself with knowledge to expand your strategy with confidence. See what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash alpha. Welcome to Alpha Trader. Our guest today is Jim Grant, the publisher and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. He's the author of several books, including The Forgotten Depression, Minding Mr. Market, Mr. Market Miscalculates, and most recently, Badgett, The Life and Times of the Greatest Victorian, about the 19th century banker and famed economist editor. Jim, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Aaron. It's great welcome to have you, you here. And we are here uh, just in the aftermath of the Fed's latest meeting and third rate cut uh, of the past year. They're signaling they're on hold for now, we think. Who maybe. cares? Who cares? <laughs> I mean, okay, there's a World Series game last night, right? All right, so what are we talking about at the water cool this morning? Are we talking about the first base umpire, the uh, right field uh, foul post, uh, uh, foul pole umpire? No, we're talking about the second base. No, we're talking 
with luck, we never talk about the umpires. We talk about the game. We talk obsessively about the umpire on our finances, which I submit to you is a blemish on the age. It is part of the problem. Not the entire I would, problem. And I would, I would agree with you, but I, I want to ask you, you're well known as a critic of the Federal Reserve. No, you know, no, not a critic, just a watcher. You know, I, I okay, a watcher, yeah. Well, is, I'm curious, you know, is there anything you would give Jay Powell credit for? Has he done anything right in this most recent cycle? Well, he has shown up for work this morning and he shows up for work every day. I give him marks for diligence. He uh, mm -hmm. has inherited a mess, which to be sure he himself helped to concoct. That mess is the manipulation of the most sensitive price in capitalism, which is the composite rate of interest. That is the, uh, you know, what price is more consequential than the rate of interest? It uh, does all the things we want of a price in finance, it measures risk, it discounts future cash flows, on and on. And this price is under the thumb of the world's central bankers, especially the bankers in Europe. So we ask what Jay Powell has done right. He has not emulated the Batinsky of the European Central Bank, formerly Mario Draghi, and now I'm afraid uh, the successor will be just as intervention-minded, Christian Lagarde. I don't know what he has done. He is, uh, <laughs> so he's, he's, he's not, he's he's not tries to do, tries to do no harm. Right. Which I think is a worthy aspiration. That's what we should all do. But he is in the business of doing the wrong thing. He is in the business of doing the wrong thing. So to that extent, Aaron, it's difficult to do a right thing. All right. So I'm curious to know, get your take on, and I appreciate what you're saying. He, The right thing he's done is not taking us into negative interest rates, which the Europeans and the Japanese have done. He's also getting tremendous pressure from the president of the United States of America. You've been watching and observing the Federal Reserve and, you know, political economy for a very long time. What do you make of all this? Is there anything like this in your memory that's at all comparable to what's happening right now between President Trump and the, his own appointed Fed chair? Well, Andrew Jackson did not appoint the, uh, the chieftain of the, the Bank of the United States way back when. But Jackson certainly was a vehement critic, I think, and a rather more tasteful one, uh, Twitter being unavailable. But in modern times, no, there's nothing like it. We uh, gasped when it was intimated that uh, President Johnson had a view on, on the Fed. And, uh, you know, President Nixon had a view on the Fed. These are things, were things that were slightly shocking, like a glimpse of stocking. And now, look, anything goes. I think the world has become, to a great degree, is kind of hardened and almost deadened in a sensory way to the tweeting from the White House. I'm not sure of what, you know, what means anymore. So, Trump comes out and says we ought to have zero percent because Portugal is borrowing at twenty basis points. <laughs> it's got, it must be frustrating. Kind of see the logic, but you know when when Trump was uh, in two thousand and sixteen before he had his current job, he talked about the false economy and he talked about the, uh, the fake uh, artificial stock market. And just because he got a new speechwriter doesn't mean he was wrong in two thousand and sixteen. But, you know, it's sort of like Mick Mulvaney. Mick Mulvaney was one of the great deficit right. hawks. I and mean, he was all for a balanced budget and for the, the order of fiscal affairs. And now, look, he's a uh, you know, trillion dollar budget. That's only a trillion dollars. He says, no, it's, deal, right. yeah. it's, it's not two trillion. We're only talking about a trillion. So that's the new Mick. So what they say about where you sit versus where you stand. So where do you stand? Uh, obviously, the deficit has exploded under this president. Was Dick Cheney right when he said deficits don't matter? Well, they have not mattered in the determination of interest rates unless you take the hypothetical view that in the absence of a trillion dollar call on savings and credit that uh, things would be just as they are now. I'm not sure how you prove that, uh, that hypothetical uh, possibility, but uh, I think the deficit and its enlargement is... Uh, is typical of, of the lack of uh, financial discipline throughout the economy. Uh, and the lack of discipline uh, in the short term has very, very agreeable consequences. I mean, except for the uh, lack of discipline, uh, SoftBank would not have its first vision fund, let alone its second or double vision fund. Right? All these, these uh, uh, the great herds of white elephants that uh, the Austrian economists call malinvestments, but which we civilians might know as, as white elephants, or to quote a 19th century British statesman, Lord Liverpool, he, he calls art, fictitious wealth. Uh, said Liverpool, the uh, tendency of uh, inconvertible 
paper money is to uh, produce, uh, create a fictitious wealth uh, bubbles, which in their bursting produce inconvenience. Inconvenience was his word. That is a charming, a charming word, word. Yes. That is the tendency of things. And of course, since 1971, which seems a long time ago, but which is a couple of heartbeats only in the long scheme of things, there has been no weight on the dollar, such weight as the collateralized dollar of yesteryear provided. So when the dollar was at least theoretically convertible for foreign central banks and governments at the rate of $35 an ounce, there was a check on our public finances, that check long since removed in the days when the general partnership was the conventional form of organization of Wall Street uh, financial firms. There was a check on the risk-taking of those firms because the general partners were at risk for their pro rata share of the debts of the firm. Now, we have no more general partnerships. There has been a, a generations-long movement towards the removal of the ancient tensions or disciplines that checked the over issuance of credit. And instead, what we have is the well-developed and observed tendency of the government to intervene at the first drop of a Dow. And that, as I say, is a very lovely thing in the short term. And where would we be without it uh, quarter to quarter? But the accumulation of these interventions and the accumulation of the loss of risk awareness and the suppression of interest rates will have, you know, will have its ultimate payoff, I suppose, negative payoff. One never knows when. I certainly don't. But that, to me, is the arc of events. I'd like to turn to the credit cycle, the topic of which you've written a ton over the years, uh, really interesting stuff. And I'm fascinated by the opening of this American Dream Mall up by the Meadowlands in North Jersey. It seems almost like a mini Disney World. It's often the case where, where the top of the credit cycle hasn't been hit until the world's tallest building is, as the final brick is laid. Well, we've got this monstrosity is now open. I'm not sure. Is it a monstrosity? I don't know. Is it, I, I think it sounds, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds like adaptive capitalism. It's best what uh, the retailers want is something to bring in the people. And maybe this is the answer. I don't know what cap rate it's being financed or the terms and conditions. But if the topic is the, the extension and the possible precariousness of the credit cycle, I think we, yes, we are precarious. I don't know. I would, I would uh, submit as uh, exhibit A, not uh, uh, this mall, to be sure, about which to, to reiterate, I know nothing but, say, uh, Uber, which is what we at Grants know as interest rates on wheels. Here is this enterprise that was founded, what, a dozen years ago? Is it more than 10 years ago with, uh, like, I don't know, 10 billion initial cap, More capital, many, many times more capital than Amazon needed to start with. And it has, in the past, I think, four and a half years, dropped at least uh, maybe $12 billion in billion in operating losses. Extraordinary. And, you know, it's uh, it's no closer to a path to profitability than it was. It, uh, it, uh, we had a, a conference at Grant, we had a Grant's conference last week, I guess, and uh, a very, very interesting speaker named Hubert Horan helped us understand uh, just the extraordinary career of Uber and uh, how it got to where it is and what it may signify for this world of, of interest rates. It's just, it's just amazing. On the flip side of Uber is is we work, which tried to... Oh, is that the flip side? It's the same so, side. So, yeah, it's side A of the like, record. Right, but, but Uber was able to push through the IPO, whereas WeWork was spotted and, and now it went from a valuation of $50 billion or more to you know possibly zero in the space of uh, a few months. Uh, well, right. Market, well, market just kept right on going. Yeah, let us reflect on that. I mean, what a, it, so uh, what does that say about... Have you guys heard about the uh, doctrine of the efficient markets? <laughs> I've heard of it, yes. Once a, very once very a popular notion. Yeah. The uh, EMH, Efficient Markets Hypothesis, which holds in its uh, strong form that uh, information is readily absorbed, almost spontaneously absorbed, into the brain of Mr. Market. And uh, this information serves to uh, uh, regulate prices uh, to reflect the, the present value of future cash flows. That's it. And it does this like clockwork. And, you know, I you can poke fun at the strong form of this thing. Certainly anyone who's tried to compete with the S&P will yield to the assertion that it is very difficult to be the market that's defined. But in fairness to the critics of the efficient market doctrine, I mean, people aren't idiots. And uh, people were enthralled to we work at what I think maybe perhaps $48 billion was the ask. Although I think to start with, Aaron, I think you were right. I think it was well above 50. The talk was kind of Yeah, yeah the talk was above 50. Yep. 
and and that only with the uh, 11th hour rescue of, uh, of SoftBank, which maybe knows something we don't, or maybe is uh, doing maybe throwing wrong. good money after bad. That's been done in Wall Street. So there's this there's this ideology, or this not an ideology, it's this this uh, mantra, or this chanty that has been, uh, I think, it has been one of the it's one of the consequences of these very low rates, and that it is the idea is that uh, you you don't set out immediately for profitability, but rather you finance heavily and you become the first mover and you achieve the growth and the scale of the network and then bingo, you are profitable. It's done. Boom. And I think this idea was crystallized in an especially annoying way. You be the judge of the annoying, but there's a in Germany there's a financial technology company called N as in Nancy 26. N26. And the uh, co-founder of uh, this uh, uh, Maximilian uh, Tehenthal was uh, speaking some time ago. I guess he was talking to the Financial Times. He was speaking in July. And here's what Mr. Tehenthal, the co-founder of N26, said about uh, this thing we used to call earnings. Quote, in all honesty, profitability is not one of our core metrics. Close quote. <laughs> now, now, Aaron and Stephen, this is the kind of thing that causes the market gods to hurl down thunderbolts at us mortals. This is not a good thing to say out loud. Not even to think. But it is, I think, a ubiquitous thought. You, you hear it uh, in real estate circles. There's a, I can't recall just now the name. It's a New York real estate brokerage firm. It's a most aggressive and it's hiring everybody. And it's, it's financed, I think, by some of the same people who brought us. We work at and they, too, see no place in the short term for this consideration of so-called profit. There's a whole economy, a sub-economy, that is doing these things, and it's supported by these interest rates, which have no basis, I say, in nature, but rather are the productions of our meddlesome central bankers. I want to bring it back to the Fed, since you just mentioned them again, but I just want to be clear. Are you, would you be shorting Uber right here? Or is that what you're recommending? Because it sounds like you think they're they're going to go to the same path as we are. I'm very bearish on Uber. We have been bearish on Uber since 2017 before it's a stock. Yeah, we're bearish on Uber. Right. And you you mentioned Amazon before. Is it possible that some of these companies are looking at what Jeff Bezos did with Amazon and saying, we can do the same, we can follow the same path, essentially, and not be profitable for years and years and years and still have a humongous market cap? But Amazon at length was profitable. I mean, Uber calls itself the Amazon of transportation, which tells you that they are not unaware of the triumph of Jeff Bezos. But uh, both Facebook and and uh, Amazon, of course, uh, become phenomenally profitable. And uh, and Amazon, furthermore, was cash flow uh, positive because it was able to finance itself uh, with its own uh, its own customers were financing it. So a very different thing from Uber, which is just uh, you know, spilling cash. It's it's nothing but a red ink gusher. And those losses are not declining, but accelerating. Why it is valued as it is, is it, to me a mystery. We could be wrong. We have been wrong in the past, but Uber is to me a mystery. And it is a mystery of this time in interest rates. I want to emphasize that. I think, I think that it is it and companies like it are creatures of, uh, of the monetary environment. A long-time reader of grants, haven't read in several years, have just been too busy. Wait, 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 wait. Yep. Let's, let's roll that one back a little bit. Was this Stephen talking? Yes. Yeah, we've been publishing for 36 continuous years, Steve. And I, you've been delinquent for how many? Uh, only a handful of those. Well, only, only is not a word that goes down well in this office, Steve. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, Full disclosure, my real introduction to the markets was I was browsing a bookstore in the mid-90s and saw Mindy Mr. Market on the shelves, checked it out, took a trip to Ireland to play a little golf, read that book cover to cover a few times, and I was hooked. <laughs> Well, that's nice to hear, but you know, a trip to Ireland is very expensive. For a, a fraction of that, you can get a subscription to grants. Right. Well, I was a subscriber for many years, but of course, I have a wife and kids now, so I, I can't afford it anymore. <laughs> no, you need it more than ever with a family. Steve. <laughs> but everyone loves it. Loves to talk to you about your cynicism about the Fed. About, about that cynicism, uh, criticism, criticism, the Fed, Uber whatever, but I was always fascinated with your long ideas. You had tons of them over the years. Yes, we did. And I was, I'm, is there anything that's interesting to you from the long side right now? Well, yes. Uh, we just had a story, an issue ago or two, and time does run on. I, I think it was, it might have been the, in the uh, next to most recent issue. 
and it was about Altria, which used to be called uh, Philip Morris before the uh, corporate uh, image makers got their blue pencils out and changed things. So people wouldn't think it's about smoking. Altria seemed to signify altruism rather than, say, nicotine. But Altria is um, a tremendously cash generative tobacco company. And it's, you know, so ethical investors must now cover their ears and turn off their podcast at least for the next 90 or so seconds. But Altria makes a lot of money at what most people don't approve of, and indeed, which has proven to be lethal. It has a, a kind of a, a unicorn of its own in Jewel. And you might have noticed this morning that it took a write down many billions of dollars in that investment. Four, yes, a huge write, a $4 billion write down. I was going to ask you about that, Jim. That doesn't change your. Nope. nope. Bullishness on Altria. Because the stock, the stock correctly was up on that news. And I mean, I, I can't do justice to my colleague Fabiano's analysis of Altria in a, in a few short seconds or minutes, but uh, we think that uh, as formidable as the headwinds are, and the, and the headwinds are like a gale, for example, the price of cigarettes goes up dramatically. I mean, when I was in the Navy, it's 100 years ago, that you could get a, a pack at the uh, uh, Navy exchange for 10 cents. <laughs> and now it's, it's $5. I mean, it's extraordinary. So the, the price of cigarettes goes, but such is the inelasticity of demand that uh, Altria keeps on making money and keeps on paying a dividend. That I forget what the dividend was, a 7% number. So people are looking around for a way to generate income in this time of uh, sub-miniature interest rates. And in a very long, I must say, th- persuasive to me to analysis of Altria. We think that this is a reliable dividend payer and it's going to weather the storms, many storms. And uh, so that's, and we think it's, it presents a very interesting contrast, uh, for example, to SoftBank, which is the fashion forward. Uh, I think ethicists approve of SoftBank because it has, says all the right things and it's into laboratory meat and other such acceptable products. But uh, SoftBank, is uh, nominally trading at one half of net asset value, but the value of those assets, as we've seen in WeWork, is highly problematical. We, if a soft bank asset can go from forty-eight billion dollars to eight billion in more or less the blink of an eye, you wonder about the rest of it. <laughs> Good point. So, Jim, before we we let you go, and I'm happy to keep talking if you're happy to keep talking. But I'm sure Stephen is as well. I'm running out of information. I've got a lot of opinions. Of okay. So, sure. I would like to get your opinion as a critic of modern central banking broadly, not just the Fed, of what Stephen and I have talked about in this podcast before about repo madness. Just this week, uh, the Fed injected another 104 plus billion dollars in short-term liquidity. They added a $45 billion 14-day repo, and they're planning to buy around 60 billion per month in treasury bills into next year. Yeah. Well, it's a sign of the times, too. And I, I would make, I think, uh, at least a couple of observations. One is that, uh, you know, in September, when this uh, repo market, this heretofore obscure uh, market made the front pages um, with a 10%, you know, that's suspect, I, I guess as much as 10% for an instant. You wonder, didn't you, what was the problem? Why didn't the market uh, satisfy that demand? Why, was the, why were the funds not forthcoming? And interest rates well below 10% in this day and age of, of tiny, tiny money market rates to, uh, to uh, profit by the sudden demand for financing of uh, this, this fine rate A collateral, treasury securities. And the answer turned out to be that, uh, that owing to post-crisis regulation, these markets are siloed, as they say, to a great degree, and, and you can't move as deftly as you once could. And so the market is kind of broken. So the Fed comes in, and it feels incumbent, the uh, need to keep coming in. So you, another thing you wonder about is, well, uh, people talk about, uh, people put this down to the lack of liquidity in the money market. That's a phrase that people, yes, they heard that nodded, uh-huh, lack of liquidity. Could it be that the problem was the overabundance of collateral? Collateral is the word that they use for treasury securities, meaning the securitized expression of the public debt. And it seems to me that the market ought to go up to express the tension that these trillion dollars worth of annual borrowings bring us. Isn't this a signal? If the Fed is in there quashing this market signal that the federal borrowing is seemingly out of control, let me retract the word seemingly, is that a public benefaction? 
So the Fed's balance sheet, I mean, people, use, I think you use the word stealth, perhaps, or somebody uses the word stealth QE. Well, nothing stealthy about the Fed's balance sheet. They publish it every Thursday. They publish it tonight. It'd be interesting to see how much they get. And here is the way it looks, growth rates over 12 months, six months, and three months. So over 12 months, something we call reserve bank credit, which is the sum of the Fed's earning assets, essentially the, balance, the assets of the balance sheet, but it was down 5.5% year over year. All right. Uh, six months, the rate of change was down almost flat. It was down 0.6%. But in the past three months, the rate of change, the rate of growth in the Fed's earning assets was 15% plus. So call it what they will, the Fed is now easy. It's one way of looking at its, at its, uh, at its policy stance. People might quibble. But one way of looking at it is say the Fed has now changed from, uh, from tautness or tension to accommodation or ease. Maybe it's not QE, but it is something to do with ease brought about through the quantitative measure of the Fed's earning assets. Let's call it QE. <laughs> Four. <laughs> yeah, right, shouldn't we? I mean, that's part of the QE part of my... Right. Um, yeah. So we say problem. In Brooklyn, we say we've got a problem with something. Part of my problem with the Fed is, is their use of language. They mean to manipulate the mind of the market. They mean to manipulate expectations. They say they, we want to help you adjust your expectations, meaning we want to play mind games. And by withholding the tag QE from this, they are saying, well, uh, trust us. It's only, it's temporary. Yeah, well, maybe. We'll know more in 10 years, I always say. Yes, and as you, as you wrote in Karen, where is it all in? In monetary defense, in the bond shake gap? Well, well, Aaron, I didn't, I uh, think in this particular respect, I was quoting the very significant presence. Yeah, Rick Reader, uh, in the uh, uh, and the money and the, and the credit market, he's the, he runs the bond business at uh, BlackRock. They have more than two trillion of bonds under their wing. And it's one thing when Grant's interest rate observer says it's going to end the debasement, which we do say that. But it's quite another one. Rick says it, which he did in his own blog post. Check it out. Go to BlackRock, look for Rick's blog, and check the end, the monetary policy end game. Read it for yourself. It's quite something. So I, I, uh, emailed Rick and I said, Rick, uh, tell me, um, this is it fair to conjecture you were bearish on bonds of which you managed so many? And at length, the uh, BlackRock communications team <laughs> response. No, that, that would be the incorrect conjecture. I can only imagine. He's not bearish. So I was left to conclude that Rick, although not bearish on bonds, was bearish on the currency in which bonds are denominated and paid. That's my view of Rick Reader's view. Maybe he'll come on your podcast. He's a formidable investor and thinker, but, but he, you know, he, he said it. He said that it will end in debasement, which to me means bad for bonds. We'd love to have, yeah, we'd love to get Rick on here and talk about his, the conjecture. But again, something that you know many of us on this podcast have been talking about and waiting for for a very long time. Well, I myself am seventy three years old, and I'm tapping my foot a little bit for the day no long, but I'm trying to eat right, get plenty of exercise, and, uh, and live another 40 or 50 years to see it all end. I mean to outlive the maturity date of the Austria 2.1s of 2117. I want to see how that one ends. How did your dad? Yes, that's going to be, and it's a fabulous performer so far this year. But on that note, we do hope you're around for another 40, 50 plus years, and we'd love to have you back. Jim Graham, thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Stephen. Jim, thanks a lot. Ready to add features to your trading portfolio? Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials from CME Group and connect to an online broker today through cmegroup.com slash alpha. Thanks for listening to Alpha Trader. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you're enjoying our show, we would greatly appreciate you leaving a review on Apple Podcasts as it will help other investors find the podcast. A brief disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing said here should be taken as investment advice. All opinions expressed on this show are the individuals alone. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.